Before the board meeting began, we ask that everyone please silence your cell phones. The Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustee meeting is an open meeting for the public to observe the board conducting, conducting district business. Therefore, patrons may only address the board during the designated audience item section on the agenda. If you have printed material you want to give to the board, please provide them to the board recording secretary, Gary Rozier, or to me, and we will provide them to the board. We also ask that the members of the audience be respectful of others, remain socially distanced at all times, wearing a disposable cloth mask over your mouth and nose at all times, and remain quiet while the proceeding is going. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Just give us one second, then I'll call the meeting to order. He's ready to go. I like that. <laughs> the meeting officially starts at six o'clock. The time is six o'clock and this meeting is hereby called to order. We have the presence of a quorum attending both in person and on video conference. Notice that this meeting has been posted online and at the Fort Bend ISD administration building for at least 72 hours. This meeting is being live streamed to the district's YouTube channel and recording of the meeting will be uploaded to the district's webpage following the conclusion of this meeting. Good evening board members, good evening superintendent, good evening everyone here today in the boardroom. And at this time, we will ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. All right, we will now stand for a moment of silence. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, at this time we will have our recognitions. Dr. Dupree. Thank you, Madam President. This evening we're going to attempt to resume a little bit of our tradition of recognizing our, our outstanding students and staff by asking the board to stand on the floor right in front of this straight part of the dais and a little with, with about two to three feet between you. And then whenever a, um, a some of our recognized individuals, they will stand just in front of us. We're not gonna shake hands. We're not gonna return to that tradition, but we're gonna take a good photo with each of the recognized individuals so they can stand right in front of us for a photo and capture a better photograph than we can with everybody standing up here. So if the board will join me on the floor, then we can get started. All right, we've got some outstanding recognitions this evening. Madam President, Dr. Dupree, members of the board. First, I would like to introduce our fantastic pledge leader, Mr. Dino Dalia, a fifth grade student from Walker Station Elementary. Let's give him a huge round of applause. 
Dieter was chosen to lead the pledges by his principal because he embodies the profile of a graduate. He participates in extracurricular activities like broadcast, choir, science fair, GT programs, and even dance at the WSE Multicultural Night last year. So he not only excels academically, but he is well respected by his peers and teachers. Thank you so much for being here this evening. You did a wonderful job. And we're gonna take your picture. Thank you so much. The next couple of recognitions are virtually, so I uh, are here virtually, and we've got some slides, so I will direct your attention as those are loading up. From Dulles High School, we have students Rhea Bizwas, Cor Connor Self, Tommy Yu, and Ray Kia Zuhid, and they were recognized by the National Speech and Debate Association for outstanding achievement in both academics and forensics. Each student received the National Forensic League's honorary designation of Academic All-American. So big round of applause for them. Next, the United States Academic Decathlon is a 10 event scholastic competition for teams of high school students. And we had students from across our district compete virtually in the Academic Decathlon meet uh, that was held in February. We had winners from Clements, Marshall, and Dulles High School. They performed very well and they finished with high scores and distinction. So I'd like to recognize a few of them. Damian Law, student at Clements High School, earned a gold event medal, which is first place in economics, and a silver event medal, second place in social science. Congratulations to Clements coach Angela Wright as well. From Marshall High School, we have Jasmine Weathers. She earned a gold event medal and in interview, so congratulations to her and her coach, Melanie Davis. And then the Dulles High School decathlon team won its fifth consecutive 6A state championship title, winning 22 individual event medals, including three perfect scores. Woo. Five students won individual overall medals for earning some of the highest scores in the state, and the team won a combined $18,500 in scholarships. And I'd also like to note that on April 16th, the Dulles High School decathlon team was recognized by the Texas House of Representatives for its achievement, which is fantastic. I will just read off their names and we'll give them a round of applause all at the end. Catherine Fong, winning three event medals and earning first place overall at honors level. Ashif Riji, winning five event medals and earning second place overall at the honors level. Suloni Moody, winning four event medals and earning fourth place overall at the honors level. Abigail Diltz, winning seven event medals, earning first place overall at the Scholastic event. Jeffrey Cheong, winning one event medal and earning third place overall at the Scholastic level. Anthony Palaza, Pazala, winning one event medal. Kevin Diwong, winning one event medal. Liam Melendez and Conrad Leong, and then congratulations to their fantastic coaching team of Kelsey uh, Helfen, Andrew Hartman, Mark Rosenbaum, Rebecca Kirkpatrick, and Casey Johnston. Big round of applause. And then we have three Forbin ISD visual arts students, and they were recognized in the final round of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo for the school art program. These three students were selected out of 3,244 pieces of artwork from 133 schools. These three students were selected um, for their phenomenal talents. We have uh, the grand champion, Jaden Kissinger from Elkins High School. You can see their art right there. That's entitled Through the Years, and the art teacher is Ryan Morales. <laughs> and then class champion, Monochromatic, Bao Yin Tran from Clements High School for the engineer that could. Art teacher Kelly Chen. And class champion painting uh, Madeline Irvin, Clements High School for an afternoon snack. Art teacher Kelly Chen. We're gonna transition back to in person. So if I could please have Miss Karen Staley Come forward for recognition. She can stand up there. She's our science teacher at Fort Settlement Middle School and Matthew Hindemarch, Hindemarch, science teacher at Travis High School. If you could join her as well, please. 
They were named the 2021 Junior and Senior Division, respectfully, Science and Engineering Fair of Houston Teachers of the Year. Congratulations to you both. And I'd also like to add that they support student achievement in STEM and dedication to the profession was highly acknowledged by their peers, administrators, and the scientific community. Thank you for being here this evening. <laughs> and next I would like to invite up Ms. Melissa, uh, Melissa Vargas. Ms. Vargas here, uh, she is being recognized. She's a currently the Fort ISD World Language Curriculum Coordinator, and she's been named Administrator of the Year by the Texas Foreign Language Association. And this honor is given each year to the administrator who has distinguished themselves through their support of their respective foreign language program. And she has served in education for 28 years. Congratulations, Ms. Vargas. <laughs> Great job, thank you. And next we have a recognition from our police department. I think we're gonna have some assistance with this presentation. Yes, thank you. The Fort Bend ISD Police Department is proud to announce the recent achievement and acknowledgement by the Texas Police Chiefs Association for Best Practices Recognition Program for their voluntary compliance of 170 best practices in law enforcement. These best practices were developed uh, to assist agencies in the efficient and de effective delivery of service, the reduction of risk, and the protection of individual rights. We're so excited to once again be recognized. Uh, and I'd like to also add that the Fort Bend ISD Police Department is one of seven school district police departments in the state of Texas to be recognized by the Texas Police Chiefs Association. So this is a phenomenal recognition. And we would publicly like to thank investigator Allison Williams, who serves as our TPCA program manager for her hard work to guard our department through this extensive process. And her role helps us remain accountable and we thank you for all you do. <laughs> and thank you to Police Chief David Ryder as well for supporting the program. Thank you so much, and thank you to our department. And we have one last recognition, and I'd like to invite our Chief Information Officer, Mr. Longbaum, to come forward. And Mr. Fahm was named as a finalist for the 2021 Houston CIO of the Year from the Orbe Awards in the nonprofit public sector category presented by the Houston CIO Leadership Association. Yes. Orbe Awards, Orbe Awards honors chief information officers in those in equivalent roles who have demonstrated excellence in technology leadership. FOM was chosen as one of five finalists from more than 135 nominations. Congratulations. true leader, thank you. And that concludes our recognition this evening. Congratulations again to all those who were recognized this evening. Job well done. You make Fort Bend ISD very proud. All right, we now move on to our audience items.
Okay. <clears throat> I will call your name. You'll be able to come to the podium. You will have three minutes. Our secretary, Ms. James, will give me a, give you and myself a 30-second warning, and at the end of that 30 seconds, you will have to conclude your comments. All right. So let's get started with Mr. John Fletcher. Good afternoon, board. I do thank you for inviting me to speak today. I just want to come in and, and talk about uh, our school district and what uh, is going on. I'm glad that school will be opening up for in-class in learning coming up, but I also want to thank you uh, for the block scheduling uh, that is going to be taking place at, at Marshall High School. I know you've been hearing a lot of stuff, a lot of people taking credit for it, a lot of people saying they, they input, but uh, Mr. Dupree, you also know that we were also there in the room. Uh, with Mr. Rodriguez, we do thank you guys. Uh, these are the girls that are gonna be affected by it. Uh, this is the one that was in the first meeting that you had with Marshall uh, the three years back that you came to meet uh, at Penny. But we do thank you. I know there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of uh, things being said, but, but uh, we, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for what's going on. Thank you for uh, all of you working together to get uh, things going. I hope it, uh, other people take advantage of it. I can't speak for no one else. I'm not gonna speak for anybody else, but I want to thank you for the behalf of Marshall High School, what, what you're doing. We want to continue the education, continue to help our kids excel um, and all that. And I do thank you for all the help. Thank you for Ms. Rodriguez for all that you've done. But just to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Our next speaker is Ms. Frank. Forget Frank. I have to wear this? Sorry, well, uh, my name is Brigitte Frank. I have two kids at Colony Meadows. And I have a hard time, whenever I go to a store, I have a hard time, nobody can hear me. And my, my six-year-old has the same problem. She's a shy little girl and, she, and her teachers have a hard time hearing her. Her friends have a hard time hearing her. And I mean, my, I've been wearing this now for 15 minutes and it's really gross inside here. And I'm just here to ask if we can please maybe consider that the kids can Stop wearing the mask outside and at the desk uh, so that they can be together and um, yeah I just I just have to stand up for them and I, I just want to and I know that you've decided the rest of the year is going to be with a mask but I just I'm just begging you to let them go maskless and let them see each other's smiles let them let them be See, like, I mean, my six, my, my little girl who's six, soon, she, she, I mean, nobody can see her sweet little smile, and she's having a hard time making friends because she has to be hiding behind this mask the whole time, eight hours straight every day. They do PE in masks. They, they're running outside in masks. Finally, they got to go on the playground today, and they were so happy. But my son's comment, he's in third grade, he said, yeah, but we had to wear our masks while they were on their playground. And so, I mean, can we please do something about this? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frank. Our next speaker is Mr. Colburn or Mrs. Company. It's on virtual. Okay, thank you. All right, our next speaker is Ms. Hamburgshin, Sita Hamburgshin. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Seda. Um, she's outside because she can't wear a mask and so I'm in here for her instead. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, um, if you look at Florida, they've been reopened totally since September and they have not had a spike in COVID cases to date. Texas has been open since March now, and there is no reason for you to be keeping our children in masks. This is ridiculous. This is a virus with a 99% recovery rate. Why are we ignoring science at this point? If you look at children who are dying from COVID, I can't even remember how many zeros are in front of it. It's like 0.0009%. 
Those children who are, who do have immune deficiencies and issues, yes, let's keep them home. Let's keep them protected. But let our children go out and play on the playgrounds and do their sports without masks. This is nonsensical. It makes me think that there's another agenda. There has to be. This is government control, and we are standing up against it. I'm just gonna speak for Ms. Data. She's a grandmother. She says that her grandsons have started asking her if it's okay for them to hug her. She says, what are you teaching these kids? When their teacher says, do not touch other kids because you will get germs. What are you te teaching them to be germaphobes? You're putting the fear in these kids. These measures have dehumanized everyone, plain and simple. Including, I'm scared to death that the lack of oxygen they're getting will give rise to childhood cancers and lung issues later on in their life. Also, we're starting to see there are chemicals in these masks that could be affecting our children's lungs. Uh, it should be up to the parent to choose if their, their child is going to wear a mask, uh, not you guys as government officials. Also, I'm speaking on behalf of Jay. He is someone who is deaf and hard of hearing. He's read lips for the past 20 years of his life, and this pandemic has been hell. He goes into stores, he can't understand anyone. He's, it's like he's walking around with earbuds in his ears all the time. So he's standing up for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Anytime government tries to fix a problem, 30 seconds, they end up making the problem worse. They end up infringing on, infringing on people's liberties. Uh, he wants to talk a little bit about autis autism which is a form of discrimination aimed at a person who is deaf and hard of hearing. We've seen that our government doesn't care about these people, and we're asking you to care and make the right decision here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Habershan. Our next speaker is Mr. Heasley. <clears throat> the body is not meant to consume what it has already expelled. We consume foods, we expel solids. We don't reconsume those solids. We consume liquids. We expel liquids. We don't reconsume those liquids. We consume oxygen. Nutrient filled. Please put your mask. Excuse me. Could you please put your mask I'm on? I'm speaking. Nutrient filled oxygen. We consume oxygen. Nutrient filled oxygen. We expel spent oxygen. Oxygen that no, Mr. Long, no longer has any nutrients left in it. It's empty. It's a gas. It's carbon dioxide. It is not meant to be consumed. We are having our children in their precious developmental years reconsume carbon dioxide for hours on end. Their little lungs are struggling to find nutrients in a gas that has no nutrients in it. When our 9-11 workers were cleaning up the rubble, they did not know the damage they did to their lungs by working in that toxic fumes for several years. And when they found out, the lawsuits came hard and heavy. God forbid that this board has put this school district, these children in harm's way to put us on some sort of a legal train wreck like what we saw there. <clears throat> A medical intervention is when a doctor gives a prescription or a regimen. For example, a regimen is put on a mask for your own health. Me medical interventions are reserved for medical professionals by law. No one else is allowed to do it. So when the board has teachers doing medical interventions seven days a week, they are acting in the capacity of a medical professional. The whole purpose of this was to protect our teachers, but instead we are potentially subjecting them to legal li liability should this thing go south. The whole set of laws in this country are set up to restrain force, not to impose it. And that means restraining it from citizen to citizen, but it also means the county officials are also restrained by the United States Constitution and all the laws down from it. It's all set up to restrain force. Now. God forbid that there is a legal train wreck coming, but when the governor's mandate was in place, even though it negates none of these laws that are there to protect us. 30 seconds. Even though it, it, it does not negate those laws, those laws are permanent, even though it provided some sort of a cloud, a covering, that the lawyers are saying that institutions like this could at least offer some sort of protection in a court of law if this should go that way, but that's gone. So all these enterprises and institutions that are keeping this mask nonsense going are completely vulnerable. 
Thank you, Mr. Heasley. Our next speaker is Mr. Anks. August, excuse me, Mr. August. Good evening, Superintendent Dupree and members on the board. My name is Patrick August. I'm a teacher here in Fort Bend ISD, completing eight years of service. I am also a product and alumni of Fort Bend ISD, where I was a part of the first graduating class of Farragut Marshall High School in 2005. Upon completion of college in 2010, I started working for a social services company where Houston residents were able to get food assistance and necessity items. It was three years in for me when I had to help read an application to a client that I realized I no longer wanted to be reactive, but be proactive in doing my part in the forever charge to educate America. I have been teaching in this district since 2013 to present. I have stayed after hours to assist students, tutored beyond the call of duty, sometimes even by phone and on weekends. Met students where they were, whatever it took for them to be successful. Of course, it doesn't stop there. I've given students lunch money, bought school supplies for students, and the list goes on. Teachers are more than teachers, you know. We're counselors, advisors, and that list goes on as well. <clears throat> I'm not looking for an applause here. It is my pleasure to do it all because I love my job and what I do. It was definitely a blatant slap in the face from the district that I had labored so hard in to issue me a non-renewal, especially when I was unaware that I was even being considered for this. In the middle of a pandemic, from the moment I received this information, I started to try to gain knowledge about this, and it seemed at every turn, <coughs> that it seemed at every turn, human resources was not cooperating nor being informative. I was finally granted a meeting with HR where I was met with the presence of legal counsel without prior knowledge. I was late, it was later told to me in a meeting with uh, our superintendent, Mr. Dupree, that legal counsel stated that he was just there for information, but in fact would not allow Glenda Johnson to speak. I still was denied information <clears throat> in this meeting. This meeting was recorded and all parties were informed. I then asked for copies of my personnel files, which it has been more than 12 days since I requested them. Still no copies to be able to properly even prepare a defense. Under duress, I submitted my resignation and preparing to figure my livelihood out to provide for my wife and my three-year-old daughter. I looked in my personnel file. None of my performance appraisals reflect that of employee deserving this. I have never been placed on a growth plan at all, nor have I ever been mentored in any areas. I have students and parents who entrusted me a second year in a different course due to my professional implementation of instruction in the classroom. My grievance is against this process and how it does not allow for the teacher, me, to have a fair shot. It 30 does, seconds. It does not protect teachers from if there is a different reason for maybe a personal vendetta against them. My concern is also that in the 4,900 teachers in this district, I am the only one who being issued a non-renewal. For what egregious acts? What laws have I broken? Where is my due process? On February ISD, it states, HR is committed to keeping employees by providing opportunities for professional growth. This was not given to me. All I am seeking here is a fair shot and not to be treated like a number. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. August. Our next speaker is Ms. Burla. Pooja Burla. All right. Our next speaker is Mr. J. Luchanan. Mr. J. Luchanan. Our next speaker is Mr. Arnold Newman. Good evening, my name's Arnold Newman. I have two children who attend Peace Island Grove Elementary. I'll be brief. Um, I got my older son who's going to uh, James Bowie next year. The electives y'all have for the James Bowie sixth graders is all artistic. I do not know why, because then that's across the entire district. It's all artistic. You have no um, other art other than no technical stuff, nothing like that, no computer training. It's all artistic. That has nothing to do with a sixth grader learning class. I'm sorry, it's an elective. And on top of that, the electives have a fee because they're banned. So I, as a parent, have to rent the equipment. And then you also have the choir. You have that divided up between male and female. You also have um, theater, 
which also requires a fee at some of the schools. Um, it's an elective. Why is I, as a taxpayer, should have to pay an additional for an elective class that's not really mandatory? It's an elective. I have an issue with it just being, I don't have an issue with it being just artistic. I have an issue with why don't you offer computer training, some other culinary skills. There's also cooking culinary. You don't, art, that's an artistic. There's other art, artistic rings out there. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Patel? Ms. Patel, excuse me. Hi, good evening. Good. I have two kids, uh, five year old and 11 year old. Uh, I had to pull them out last year as soon as this COVID protocol started because they have to wear mask and a lot of restrictions. So I started homeschooling for them. I'm here to request and beg ISD to stop the mask mandates so that kids can breathe freely. freely. They can enjoy their play. Uh, they can have human touch to each other. Teacher can see the kids smile. Kids can see the teacher's uh, emotions and facial expressions and everything. And I really want to put back the kids to the school that's the uh, only reason i and i have i have few more uh, dehumanizing effect that the mask does on the people in the normal conditions the air contains 20% of oxygen and the 0 0.3 0 0.03 carbon dioxide these gas concentrations significantly affect uh, significantly altered when the breathing occurs through the face mask. A trap air remaining between the mouth and the nose and the face mask is rebreathed repeatedly in and out of the body containing low oxygen and high carbon dioxide concentrations causing the hypoxemia and hypercapnia. In addition to the hypoxia and hypercapnia, breathing through the face mask residues bacterial and germ components on the inner and outer layer of the face mask. The toxic components are repeatedly rebreathed back into the body, causing the self-contamination. Breathing through the face mask also increases the temperature and humidity in the space between the mouth and the mask, resulting in the release of the toxic particles from the mask materials. Psychologically wearing face mask fundamentally has negative effects on the wearer and the nearby person. Basic human-to-human -human connectivity through the face expression is compromised and self-identity is significantly eliminated. One more, the human, dehumanizing mask par partially delete the uniqueness and the individuality of the person wearing it as well as the connected person. Social connections and relationships are the basic human needs which innately inherited in all public whereas reduced human to human connections are associated with the poor mental and physical health. Do we really want to cause these damages to our kids? 30 seconds. That may have lasting impact on their future lives. Also where when did science conclude that one solution will fit all? The mandates and the restrictions have been going on for too long. I beg you all to return the schools to complete normal uh, com coming far and let our future generation live in the most wonderful years of their lives without fear. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Patel. Our next speaker is Ms. Amanda Weaver. Ms. Amanda Weaver. All right, that concludes our audience items for this evening. Thank you, Mrs. James. Our next item on our agenda is our <coughs> item 6A1. Consider approval of the superintendent search plan and meeting summary and related superintendent search confidentiality agreement. Madam President, I move to approve the recommended action. Second.
do we have any questions at this time? Is your presentation? I just want to make sure anyone has any questions. Is this just for the board agreement item that we're? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, que no questions. No questions right now. All right. At this time, I ask um, for you all to use to vote. Um, for those who are in the room, our voting uh, machines are working, I was told. So we're going to try it this evening. And so um, those who are virtual, if you could just raise your hand. So at this time, please vote. If you're on virtual and you would like to vote yes, please raise your hand. All right, this, that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, our next item is to consider approval of the superintendent search leadership profile report. Madam President, I move to approve the recommended action as presented. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Do I have HYA on the call? Yes. Madam President, are they going to be giving us a presentation on this item? I'm sorry? Are they going to be giving us a presentation on this item? The S. Okay, good. Because I have some questions. Rick, I think you're going to start and... Um if we could ask uh, the co-host to uh, start our videos and uh, also start the PowerPoint presentation. Mr. Flynn, I'm sorry, we, we can't hear you, Mr. Flynn. Rick Berry is going to begin. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Very good. You can begin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, good evening, and uh, we're, we're pleased to be here with you this evening and present our report. Uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to highlight our uh, leadership profile that we have prepa uh, prepared and respond to any comments or questions that, that you might have about that. Uh, if we're on to the next slide, uh, uh, beyond this one, okay, the lead, on the leadership uh, profile report, we have, uh, we have two overall objectives for, for this uh, part of the agenda. First, to, for the trustees to have detailed knowledge about the process and outcomes of the community engagement activities uh, and to finalize and approve the leadership profile. I want to remind you that you can uh, ask uh, questions at any time. Uh, later in the meeting, we'll ask you to uh, review, revise, and approve uh, the profiles. And just and remember, at any time, you don't have to wait till the end to ask questions. Uh, at any time, you can stop us uh, on any on comment or question that you want to ask. I'm getting a bit of feedback from those that are on the call. Let's see if it's your microphone, Mr. Flynn. If you could continue, let's see if, it, let's see if it's yours. Okay, well, it's, it's me. It's Rick Berry that I'm the one speaking. Is mine doing that? Oh, okay, yes, very good. Okay. So it's not doing it, so I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I'm not confusing you. I think I'm, it's clear now. Thank you. No problem. Okay, the, ne the next slide uh, on the report, or here's, uh, here's what's happened in the last 25 days uh, since our planning meeting. Uh, we have planned the search and community engagement. Uh, we did a more district research. Uh, Invitations to participate in this process have been uh, sent. Uh, we posted and analyzed the survey, uh, conducted interviews and meetings 
uh, in the district uh, and virtually state. Uh, we've uh, done data compilation and analysis of the information and then prepared the report and presentation. We followed the schedule uh, that was set by the board and that really began on March 31st at our planning meeting. Uh, the next slide, uh, we'll have some details, but these seven bullets in this particular slide uh, outline uh, what uh, we did get to tonight, uh, what we did to get to uh, this meeting tonight. So uh, on, the, on the next slide here, the, uh, the district research, we continued to study the publicly available information about Fort Bend ISD. Uh, invitations were extended uh, by the board president and by Veronica Sofer and her staff on behalf of the board of trustees. Uh, Veronica Sofer and her staff also scheduled uh, interviews and meetings uh, that were held as part of this process. We wanna offer uh, our thanks uh, to all of the staff members who assisted in facilitating our time in the district uh, special thanks to President Eliger, Dr. Dupree, Jesselyn Allen, Veronica Sofer, and her staff, and thanks also to Deanna Duran and Gary Rozier and other staff members for all of their extra efforts in making us feel welcome, handling the necessary arrangements for our meetings, and assistance at the meetings and the follow-up. Uh, so we really appreciate all the help it's been uh, amazing and uh, and just great to work with your folks. So I think Nola is next. Good evening. Um, thank you. And it was very nice to see all the recognitions this evening. Congratulations uh, to everyone. Uh, this is a result of the online survey. You had over 2200, 2249 staff and stakeholders who completed the survey. We're very pleased with that number. Uh, it was a, you know, a couple of week timeline and for this participation, we're pleased with it. 82% of the respondents were parents. And then you can see the rest of the breakdown. Um, all seven board members, in addition to these that are listed here, took the survey offline and we have results compiled um, for every group that's listed here. In the survey, if we could go to the next slide. In the survey, here are the top five areas in the state of the district with the highest percentage of respondents selecting agree or strongly agree from the uh, 2249 online respondents. And again, the board members responded. The board chose four of the top, same top five areas. So you can see from the bolded areas, those are the five areas of strengths for all the respondents gave and the board members listed as well, the top four. The parenthesis afterwards indicates certain areas of of um, the school district, the technology integrated in classroom means teaching and learning. The uh, district engages with diverse racial, cultural, and socioeconomic. That means community engagement. And then the M after facilities are well maintained means the management of the district. In the next slide, it you can see the board's additional assessments of the state of the district emphasize setting high standards. The, the board specifically talked about those high standards, the efforts across the district to close the achievement gap, the fiscal responsibility of the district is strong and the infrastructure for technology. The board of trustees mentioned all of these areas in their uh, survey responses. And then on the next slide, when we chose the top competencies for the next Fort Bend ISD superintendent, here are the top five that were chosen overall, again, on the online survey. Three of the top five were also selected by board members, and those are there as well. 
uh, the top competencies being recruit, employ, and retain effective personnel throughout the district, uh, provide transparent communication, and then all the respondents and the board members listed the bottom three, understand and be sensitive to the needs of a diverse student body, um, student population, foster positive professional climate, and establish a culture of high expectations for all students. And all of the four areas of competencies, the community engagement, the vision and values, teaching and learning and management were included in these five choices. So certainly a well-rounded person is called upon by the results from the survey. In addition, on the next slide, the board also selected these three competencies that the next superintendent should have, and that is uh, the ability to plan and manage long-term financial health of the district, under the management competency to be visible throughout the district and actively engage in community life through the community engagement competency and then demonstrate a deep understanding of educational research and emerging best practices and implement strategies. Again, the board indicated teaching and learning competency was very important to them. In the, on the next slide, the listening sessions, they were all conducted in the same format. We asked for um, the same questions throughout and relatively the same amount of time, approximately 50 minutes for each section ha session. However, some groups spend a little more time maybe on strengths or on characteristics than others. We asked for the strengths of the district and the challenges of the district for every, uh, in every listening session. That's a foundational piece that we will use in recruiting. And, and then the, the third area were characteristics of the next superintendent. And then we asked for um, what would attract a candidate to the Fort Bend ISD community and all of the municipalities and to give us some possible uh, candidates. And so I think now I turn it over to well, Ms. Flory. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Thumbs yes, up. we can. Thank you. Great. Um, so in total, we conducted 37 meetings during three days. Um, we had 176 people attend um, those meetings throughout the, the course of the week um, and really discussed, talk, asked them about what they felt were the strengths and challenges that the district was facing and two, what they believe the superintendent characteristics should be. We, um, and their feedback is reflected in the summary that you're about to see in these next slides. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, the leadership characteristics that are listed here really came across in uh, from people in all of the listening sessions. This is really what rose to the top. Um, you see here that it says, you know, somebody who's in terms of attributes that we're looking for, um, someone who is personable, a people person. What we mean by that, what people were really talking about, what you were hearing consistently was they wanted somebody who was going to be accessible, um, someone who is relatable both to the students and to the staff um, and, and the teachers. They, they didn't want somebody who was going to be putting on airs. Um, in terms of transparency, really looking for that straight shooter, someone who's forthcoming with information. Um, and then, you know, I guess by, in terms of attributes, somebody who, you know, wants to share information, not because it's a have to, but really prescribes to a no surprises approach in terms of how they work with both the board and the larger community. Um, obviously somebody who's honest, um, somebody who is a lifelong learner and how they approach their work with the district, um, really wanted somebody too who's innovative um, and, we, and in saying that, what we were hearing too is somebody who's really looking proactively for ways to improve the district and build upon best practices. We wanted somebody who's, you know, visionary, 
um, and really sees kind of how to move the, the um, what's with the district from, from good to great, if you will. Um, and a team builder, and that really somebody who can bring folks together. Um, that was what we classified more as attributes. On the next slide, you'll see more a focus and emphasis on expertise. You really see too, in terms of the, the numbers behind, it was across um, different kinds of classifications, if you will, of people participating. So I actually conducted a lot of the sessions with parents and um, was hearing this from several people within those sessions. But then again, when you talk to students or you talk to um, staff administration, you kept hearing this common theme, somebody who is really a strong communicator. And the heavy emphasis that on the communication skills was also that they um, really um, understand that listening is very much part of the communication skill. Um, but somebody too who could really effectively share their vision, explain their game plan and bring people along with that vision. Um, the instructional leadership component. What you were hearing was, so they wanted somebody who had experience in the classroom, perhaps experience as a principal, but in, in essence, who, who, under, who had the instructional background and could lead in that kind of a way. Um, in terms of the diverse leadership, what you were seeing or hearing is um, and, and, and let me clarify too, in terms of that word diversity, what we were hearing was, was people um, acknowledging the breadth of diversity, um, whether that was socioeconomic, um, whether that was ethnic, whether that was um, people too with different abili abilities, different language learners, um, but just that there was a great breadth and that somebody who had, um, again, some experience working with um, students of a di of, of, of diverse um, with diverse backgrounds. Um, in terms of finance, I think there was definitely an acknowledgement that the district has over a billion dollar budget, and they didn't want somebody who this was their first rodeo figuring out how to manage that budget, um, and who really could handle both the expense side and the revenue side of of really bringing dollars into the for the district. Um, and then too, there was an acknowledgement: you're a large district. Um, you're over 70,000 students, and that's, you know, a challenge for somebody who, who um, I, again, just kind of that breadth of, of, of experience and how they would lead that, lead the district of your size. Um, on the next slide, we talk a little bit more about um, the administrative style. And what you're seeing there is um, really the key things that kept popping was that desire to have somebody who was very visible and approachable. And what you heard more specifically is they wanted somebody who believed in spending time in the schools and having face time with the folks who actually make up the district. Um, they, and, and they, the other thing too was around um, somebody who had a collaborative style. Um, and you've heard the whole, um, the saying, many hands make light work. I think what the, where people were coming from is that many brains and individual strengths and talents make for great work. They didn't want to see somebody who was um, feeding siloed approach. Um, instead, somebody who would really tap into and bring out the best in people um, to, to, towards a shared goal of serving students and making the district the best that it can be. Next slide. Um, so um, what you're seeing now for the leadership um, profile report is the information that NOLA presented in the, from the survey data and then what I brought, shared with you from the listening sessions, those two combined um, come together to make the, to, to list out the desired characteristics, the draft that we're going to present to you today. Next slide. Um, and on this slide, what you see are at the very top, it's the eight character or eight competencies that NOLA shared with you from the online survey. And then the portion below are the 14 characteristics that I shared that came out of the listening sessions. Those combined are the 22 characteristics that really are the basis that we utilize for the rec and what we want you to, or what we recommend for you to consider as the profile for your next superintendent. 
Peter's going to take it from here and really share um, more specifically now how that um, leadership profile comes together in a one pager. Thank you, Lisa. President Helliger, members of the board, uh, we appreciate the opportunity tonight to take all of these attributes and on the next slide uh, show you how we tried to put it into uh, paragraph form. And as you can see, uh, for this first slide, we highlighted three of the attributes, innovative instructional leader and diverse school district experience. Uh, and the purpose of that, of course, is to show our use of those characteristics that rose to the top, both in listening sessions and later through the survey. The uh, idea is to highlight them now. If you would like them highlighted in the final version, of course, we can do that um, as well, or we can just let them uh, fade into the, the remainder of the paragraph. In the next paragraph, on the next slide, you'll see a lot more of the characteristics in this um, visible and approachable are in there the building and unifying teams, honesty, transparent communicator, and as Lisa mentioned, somebody who listens. And we heard from people to listen actively as well, and uh, collaborative uh, in terms of decision-making and problem-solving, and also in, in terms of uh, developing the vision, and you'll see that a little later. And then the people person um, and is, does this mean somebody who's a good communicator and who listens? Yes, it does. Um, they strategically approach the human resource function uh, in this particular um, uh, set of the paragraph. In the next slide, um, we see the, the final paragraph, and that is uh, the one that outlines being a visionary, um, but recognizing the importance of taking that vision into the implementation phase and including people uh, in that process, both at the very beginning and the implementation as well. And then finally, uh, somebody who has a, a real sound understanding of the fiscal operations of a district like Port Bend ISD. And then uh, finally, uh, the superintendent competencies, and these are um, competencies that were found in the survey, and you'll recall that there was a little bit of an explanation there. Uh, we also have what we call a, a white paper, um, and I can explain more about that, but each of these uh, competencies is based upon an analysis of research that's done um, over a, a great deal of time on effective superintendents and the characteristics that those effective superintendents have. And of course, as you know, there were 12 that were listed on the uh, survey and you were only uh, asked to select four that were most mission critical. Um, but the ones that rose to the top, uh, both from the board selection and from the overall uh, selection uh, were these eight. And so that's why uh, we put them there. Uh, and of course this, as well as uh, the general profile is the board's uh, prerogative. So on the next slide, um, the print gets a little smaller, um, but this is the, these are the three paragraphs with the attributes in them. And then uh, before we get to the next slide, I'll just tell you what that is. That's gonna be the one that, that has the competencies on it. And the question that we wanna uh, put before the board at this point is, are there any elements that you were hoping would be in the profile that are not in the profile? And conversely, are there any elements that uh, are here that you feel need not be here? Um, and again, we told you the uh, way in which we got them to be here, but it, this is the board's uh, profile and we want this to be representative of what the board feel is, feels is. Thank you. Um... Mr. Flynn, um, thank you for um, presenting that and taking the time to put this together for us. Um, we might have some questions. I, I do, when you when you talked about, um, just, just a quantitative question for me real quick. The leader of a large school district, and I know there's not a lot of, um, a lot of large school districts, so what, what are we really saying there?
So I'll take that one. Um, I, I think you would say certainly a school district that is, um, in terms of compensating school districts, somebody who has experience in a school district of at least 40,000 students. And some of the difference there is that when you have a smaller school district, a lot of times you can really lead um, through more direct management. You know the names of all your principals. You know that you, you have um, a lot more of those direct reports. And when you get to us, um, when you're working, leading a school district of your size, you may be great with names and really out in the community, but just the sheer size is you're going to need to have that expertise of how do you lead through people. Um, and so again, somebody who has some experience and can make that distinction. Another component of that too is, um, um, by the way, I just got a, a text. Um, uh, Peter's having some power, power outage issues. So we, um, I think he'll be joining us again by phone right now. Um, so um, it, it's, it's that level, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought when I got that, that um, text from Peter. So, so again, it's in terms of actually your management style, but then again, that expertise as well. Um, obviously, I mentioned the budget. It's a big difference when you're going to a budget of, um, you know, for, for a school district that's serving, you know, three or 5,000 students um, versus a district of your size where it then becomes a billion dollar budget. Mm -hmm. And that was what I would, sorry, I'll, I'll leave it there. I can go on, but you get the idea. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood because I know we've had some conversations before where there aren't that many large school districts. So I want to make sure that we weren't we were not um, limiting ourselves with the search to a very small pool of people. That was that was really the reason for that questioning. So I'm going to open it up to the board members. I saw Ms. James's first. Yes, thank you, Ms. Holliger, and thank you to HYA for a very nice presentation with a lot of good information in it. You did answer a number of my questions as you were going along, so that was that was good and effective. I'm glad I kept listening instead of interrupting. Um, I guess I have two, uh, I don't know if they're questions or concerns. Um, one is, I'll start with the question, in the bullets under the establish a culture of high expectations for all students and personnel. Can one of you expand on that a little bit more? And um, I guess what I'm, my concern is, is that we don't have any, we don't have academic, high academic expectations identified there. We, it came up in the seams in the survey, it, closing the achievement gap and high academic expectations, but I don't see it so much in this uh, final version. So I, I'm not sure who can address that. I'll address it if you don't mind. The It is inferred and you're right, we can be clear there because it is under the teaching and learning competency. So it is intended to be academic. That being said, there are other ways in addition to academics for high expectations in terms of the many uh, groups that you have, both curricular and non-curricular, that you have expectations for students to do well. But it is intended to be academic and uh, we can clarify that. Okay, that would, be, that would be great. I'd like to have that in there. And then my second question is around the use of the word diverse and diversity. Um, I think that Fort Bend ISD has a very unique situation in terms of its diversity. I do not think that uh, a, unless a person is familiar with Fort Bend and the Houston region that they would necessarily understand the diversity that we're referring to in this document. And I guess I want to know how are we going, how can we better um, advertise that, explain that? Do we need a little, a little more information here to, uh, to go along with this so that 
people who are seeing this can can fully understand the, the, the unique diversity and the varied aspects of diversity that we have in this school district. I think that um, I think that we can certainly do that. I will. Uh, um, so Noel and I, we, 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 the whole team, we spent a lot of time listening to your community, and I um, would agree with you, Dr. Gilliam. It was really actually pretty phenomenal and really beautiful in that f folks didn't call out only one kind of diversity that they saw in the district. Your community very much acknowledged the breadth of diversity. Um, I have to say where I think I was most impressed in hearing that articulated was from your students. Um, and um, I think that we um, certainly do that when we are talking and recruit, talking to individuals and recruiting them. But I think that that's something in terms of the, the section that we have on um, profiling the different, the dis profile of the district itself that we can really highlight that attribute and again the breadth and depth of diversity. Okay well I think that that's really important because the person that we recruit to be the next superintendent um, needs to be comfortable with all those types of diversity and I think that that's absolutely critical to, to the success of that person not to mention the success of our district. I would encourage you to reach out to our communications department. In the past, we've produced a very lovely flyer that talks, um, that highlights um, a lot of the aspects of diversity of the district. And I think that, that from that, you might be able to um, glean some statistics that are, um, that are uh, dis very descriptive and that would be helpful in, um, it, uh, in including with this um, leadership profile. I appreciate that. We will do that. I apologize for my abrupt uh, exit. Uh, we had a power outage here. We've had two earlier today, and uh, that was the cause of my leaving the room. I apologize. Not an issue, Mr. Flynn, Dr. Flynn. All right, thank you. Um, Miss, I don't know who I saw first, so... I'm just gonna go this opposite way. Dr. Shirley. And uh, good afternoon, good evening. Okay, I'm just gonna, again, piggyback on uh, some of the uh, things that have already come up. Okay, first of all, uh, the approachable large school district leader. I'm gonna go uh, there also. When we are looking for a large school district leader, we are truly uh, narrowing the pool and just because you've had, this is my opinion, just because you've had experience in a large district does not necessarily mean that you're qualified over someone who's had, who has not. Um, however, it would be what I would like to see is being able to open it in some way. When we're talking about 40,000 students, we need to look I would think that we would look back also, not necessarily just on uh, their superintendency and what they've done before, or had they been there before, but the entire history of the candidate. And I, I truly believe this will definitely limit the, the pool, and that concerns me. Also, on page 54, number eight, I, I kind of get hung on words when, um, and I try to understand them in the way that I receive them. So what is, what is meant by a deep sense of honesty? I would think honesty is just honesty. So I'd like to, I would like that to be defined. And then I actually look up, when I think of honesty, I think of transparency. So how, and I, I understand what both words mean, but I don't understand how they are being used in order to uh, identify a superintendent candidate. When you're referring to page 58, do you mean in the, the larger report? Or I said, I'm sorry, 54. I may have said 58, 54. Oh, no, you said 54, number eight is what you said. Yeah, that's right. 
So right. Is there slide any 19, I believe it is, slide 19. Is that what it is? And it's in other places in the report also, several yeah, times. And, and what we tried to do is to, to use words such as honesty, and that's what ended up in, in our recommendation for the profile. Um, but th did we put that in the profile? Well, I'm reading at the top of page 54, Fort Bend ISD leadership profile report, desired okay. characteristics of the superintendent. So that's slide 19, uh, Dr. Flynn, it's, and it shows where, I believe it is, the poor seeks someone who is guided by a deep sense of honesty and is transparent communicator who listens carefully and uses- oh, I see, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so that's, um, thank you. So if you'd like to, like us to modify that and just use the word honesty, that's that's not a problem. We can do that. I think our question is using the word honesty. Is that correct? It, it's not necessary. I want to know the difference between honesty and transparency. That's just me. If we're saying, oh. right, we're saying a deep sense. I don't, I definitely, if we're using that, if you're honest, you're just honest. I don't think you have to have a deep sense. Okay. However, I'm sorry. No, no, I think, I think, you're right. Um, when I read this, I thought about it being more around forthcoming. Um, I, I, I definitely uh, yeah. agree and I understand. And when I don't understand, I always look up the word. I looked up the word to see exactly what it meant. And so how could we have a deep sense? But I don't ne necessarily want to belabor on that. I'd like to know how in this particular sentence, and this is just really so I can understand it. Um, a transparent communicator who listens. So how does that look? How, if we're saying we're going to look for this person, how does that person look in other language that I could understand? So I, I'll take a step at that. I, I think in terms, um, I, actually, I, I think your points are well taken. I think those are good edits um, in terms of the um, feedback on the honesty. I think you're, you know, spot on. In terms of, of the transparent communication, I think it's a little of, of what um, President Heiliger had said as well in terms of somebody being more forthcoming. It's a little of what, um, you know, I had shared in relaying what we had heard from the in the listening sessions, transparency kept coming up, and 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 I should say it again. I when when I personally was taking notes during the listening session, I spoke at the beginning, and then my job was to listen and take notes, and this was the feedback that we were getting from the community, and they were choosing and repeating and using that word transparency. And I think some of it, again, was, you know, this, um, I, I think that the, the, the sentiment was about, about the district and the district leadership being forthcoming with information, but the word choice was transparency. So that's why that got utilized in this, is that we didn't want to necessarily change the language that the community was choosing to, to you know, subscribe to for this for this um, exercise. Um, I would also say too, just so to ensure and underscore that we really are listening to the board. You said you, as a collective, had said at the very beginning that you did not want to limit the pool of candidates based on what their current background is, and we heard that we're keeping the funnel wide. However. We also, in terms of the feedback that we were hearing from both the online, well, really from the online survey, is, is it kept getting underscored that they wanted somebody who had that expertise and came from a large, you know, who had some experience with a large district. I think that there is that possibility to really um, keep the funnel wide and really make sure that we're welcoming um, a a, a wide spectrum of candidates that may be able to serve the district. Uh, it is too, though, that we want to make sure they actually have the competencies to be able to serve your district well. And perhaps, too, as a former board member, like uh, my example I go back to, I was a treasurer for several years, and you want to make sure that you know somebody, you have somebody who can mind your books, 
I don't, know, don't mean literally, but you know, who really can manage a district with that large of a budget. That's one example. And I don't believe that we, we are trying to keep that funnel wide at this point, but we will compare the experiences of the candidates that come to us with these characteristics. And if we have someone that, oops, 35,000, it's a cutoff, that's not the way we do it. It may be someone who's been in a 15,000 student district or something that's smaller than that. And then they will have in their other uh, attributes and characteristics and experiences, things that will bring up that area. And we will be able to say, however, they've had experience as an assistant superintendent or a principal or some other experience that we believe will allow them to do well in Fort Bend. So it, they aren't hard uh, cutoffs. I think when we bring the candidates to you, you will see and want how they balance and uh, the best of the best in this comprehensively, we will, we will bring forward. Yeah, I, just to add to that discussion, I, I think we intentionally use the word leader um, to indicate a lot of different capacities one could have in a, in a large district, as opposed to saying a superintendent of a large district. And so that, that was intentional in our draft. Um, and that was what we meant. Oh, thank you. And uh, just in response to that, and I, I do appreciate the word leader. I uh, totally agree. Uh, and I do appreciate the explanation that what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Wellman, is that we are going to keep it open uh, as much as it possibly can and looking at other means of experience. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would just like to add just to that point real quick is that we're looking at scale as well, right? So um, that, that has to factor into that, right? When we're looking at the, all the attributes and the uh, and the um, the profile, the scale of the work, the fiscal responsibility as well too, based on what they currently have, what what they're able to achieve. All right, Ms. Hannah. And complexity in the complexity of the district. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Hannah. Thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. I just have a, a couple of questions and. Um, I know this is 101, and you're going to think I'm not listening. Um, but ex can you explain exactly how the the leadership profile that we're looking at here is used during the search? Is it published? Is it just used to guide you during um, uh, the interview, the initial interview process? Yes, and yes. Can I, if I can uh, jump in, and uh, um, Lisa and. Uh, Nola and Rick can, can uh, augment anything I say. What we do is we take the profile and we look, we, we do a focus recruitment uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, and with that focus recruitment, we try to find people who substantially meet this profile. And we ask them to sh tell us about the work that they have done in these areas. And after they describe their work, we ask them to submit evidence of the success of the work because we want people who not only have experience, but have experienced success in these areas. And so we ask people typically to show us at least three data points over a time period that indicate success of children in a diverse school district in these areas that we're talking about. Because Basically, having more children to learn and children to learn more is what the profile is all about. Um, so then after that second step of having them provide evidence of success, the third step is to talk with people, not just the reference given to us by the candidate, but people who should be familiar with this candidate's work and ask them specifically did this individual lead the work that led to the change and brought success to students 
in these areas that we're talking about. So those are the, the three steps that we typically take. And yes, we use, the, we use questions patterned after the profile. Um, and I don't know if you talked about this, but this profile lines up really well with uh, Exhibit A in, in the board's policy, uh, BJA local, um, it, those seven competencies that are listed in, in that exhibit are uh, the board's policy are in this profile. And uh, that being the case, it aligns with what the district has traditionally looked for and also what the board adopts as a profile. Okay, so it's not, it's not something you're publishing. It's not, it's not going oh, yes. to the candidates. It is going yes. to. Okay, so oh, that, yes. so that, that's that's my question. So, so if it wasn't going to the candidates, I, I, I can, I can live with it. But if it's being published, I have a few um, questions. So, to Miss Jane, and, and, I, I'm sorry, just the Mr. Flynn. We're just talking about the profile. Yeah, just first. the profile, just the profile, yeah. and then, and then you can maybe share with me how some of the other documents um, are going to be used. Um, but to Ms. James's point about um, the word diverse, um, I know we're trying to catch, you know, cast as wide a net as we can, and I know that's hard because we are such a large school district, but I think using the word uniquely diverse, looking for leaders who understand uniquely diverse school districts, because we are uniquely diverse. Here and and I'm not sure that we that that there are a whole lot of school districts out here, um, in the U.S. that 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 look like ours. So thinking in terms of that, um, up in the first paragraph, and then right. at and then at the bottom, uh, where we have uh, at the the last sentence, uh, implementing a vision with a sound understanding of fiscal operations of a district like Fort Bend ISD. I'm I'm wondering. It kind of goes back to. Um, Ms. James asking what high expectations means. I'm wondering if we can include the word um, a sound understanding of the fiscal and instructional operations, and maybe operations isn't the best word to follow instructions, but I just feel like that, that we, want, we want that word, I want that word there. I'm not sure about the rest of the board, but. What page are you on, Miss Hannah? I'm on page 56, but it's or, or 57, but it's on it's on the profile report. It's the last paragraph. Yeah, it, so, so you, you're you're saying put it there rather than up on the first paragraph where it talks about instructional leader. Well, I, I guess it can can remain there. I think my my purpose in in adding it down here is that. You know, I think in a district this size, it's so important to understand how, you know, the instructional program guides should be guiding very much of the budget. Oh. Um, that it's not a standalone, that the budget itself is not, it, it's, it's married to the instructional program, even the building of our schools and the, the AC and the, you know, the HVAC systems. They're, they're all, that budget is tied back to instruction. And I just want to capture that somewhere in this this bottom. Please put your mic I on. Said, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if that's what I'm. I, I'm. I'm just wanting to underscore um, with a budget this size that that it's just really important to understand those two components together. So your suggestion, if I could just clarify, is understanding of fiscal and instructional operations of a district like Fort Bend ISD? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Okay. I'm just capturing it. Yeah. All right. And, and without wordsmithing, uh, but if, if the board is in agreement to the, the sense of Ms. Hannon's uh, suggestion, it could read fiscal operations as it is related to the instruction of a district like Fort Bend ISD. So before we do that, I just want to add this one comment to that, that I feel like is missing from here is that we need to have a statement in here around the achievement gap that has looking for someone that has a demonstrated um, track record 
of um, reducing their uh, the achievement gap in their area. I think that's important to us, and I don't see that here. I really don't. It's not. It's not rising up out of this document to me. That could easily be uh, added um, to the first paragraph where it says, with a track record of success with the achievement gap. That's why I wanted to wait, Ms. Hannah, just to kind of maybe put it all together a little bit. I think that this is exactly why we have this working session with the board. Um, we, as, um, as a team, had discussed this aspect. And while um, the achievement gap was called out as a challenge, we didn't necessarily hear that repeated in terms of what, what somebody was looking for in the expertise and the skill set and closing that gap. And it was not, um, we didn't want to create that and put that in. So I'm really glad that you have called that out to, as an addition that should be added in terms of a um, expertise, uh, area of expertise and, and proven track record. Thank you. All right. And so are, are we going, uh, Dr. Flanner, are we going through some of the other documents that were in our board packet? Um, or, uh, I mean, I can wait. I just had some questions on some of the other, uh, like Ms. Flores mentioned, that, that the, the gap rose up in the challenges document that we saw. It wasn't explicitly worded that way. Um, but I, I, I will wait on it, but I'm just, I'm curious how those other documents that we, we received to review are, are used beyond uh, you uh, in the interview process. Yeah, I would say that uh, if, if, uh, if, if you wanted to talk about those, we're, we're ready to, uh, to receive that as well and, and respond to that. Um, but um, if, if, you, if you wanted to finish the profile of desired characteristics, that might be one way to do it and then and just move on to other, other things that uh, you have concerns about. Yes, because the, the current motion on the floor is to talk about the profile itself. So I do want to make sure that we get through the profile and any changes and updates that this board may have for the profile. And then we can go into um, any of the other questions that you may have of the, uh, of the supporting material. Right. Ms. Hannah, do you have any other questions about the profile? No, no. Thank you, Ms. Helliger. All right, thank you. Does, he, does any other board members have any other questions about the... Mr. Rosenthal. So the only thing I would add, if you're going to change that language, um, as the doctor says, is kind of put Mr. Rosenthal, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Hang on. There we go. Is that better? Is that better? A little bit. Okay. So I, I would say that uh, if we're going to add that last bit of language about budget and instruction, um, I wonder if you, you really can't stop just at the word instruction because what about budget and fine arts? What about budget and athletics? So there's a whole lot more than just instruction. So uh, maybe a different word. So not that I want to sit here all night and wordsmith, but, but if you're going to try to capture that thought behind the budget or the fiscal, the fiscal responsibility, the fiscal knowledge, uh, I wouldn't just use the word instruction. Was there was there an ask? Maybe I missed that. Are you talking about the last um, paragraph of the profile report? Because currently it says the fiscal operations of a district like Fort Bend ISD. Okay, so, I, and I think the point that maybe Miss Hannon was making was uh, she didn't like just the word fiscal operations. She wanted to tie it to. Um, um, instruction and that's where I think Dr. Flynn was starting to put the two words together in a sentence but I, I'm just suggesting that if we if we're going to do that then you have to kind of take it to other aspects that that the, the budget um, affects like some of the other things I mentioned so it's not just instruction 
Okay, very good, very good input. So Mr. Flynn, I, I think the question is for your needs tonight on approving this report is, do you just need the, you don't need us to, to wordsmith it per se. You, right. you have it? Madam President, can I make an amendment to the motion? One, one sure. second, one second. I just wanna make sure he um, responds. Um, what What is the ask? I just wanna make sure everyone's clear what the ask is for this profile report that you need for us to approve tonight. Just that it contain the elements that you wanna see in it, not necessarily, we can work on the, the verbiage uh, afterward and, and still retain the integrity of your changes. Okay. All right, so we made some changes and updates and, and, and adds to the profile. So I really think based on the current um, amendment, excuse me, the current um, motion that's on the floor, it would need to be amended just with the, uh, with, just with um, the updates. Yes, ma'am, I would like to propose an amendment to the motion on the floor. In the first, um, paragraph that we use the modifier uniquely in front of diverse school district with a track record of success and add the word phrase with closing the achievement gap to that sentence. I would also like to suggest our, our um, amend paragraph two the sentence, the board seeks someone who is honest and is a transparent communicator who listens, dot, dot, dot. Uh, then on the slide, well, on the third paragraph, with a sound understanding of the fiscal and instructional operations of a district like Fort Bend ISD. And then my the, my, the last change would be to split the fifth bullet into two bullets. One would say establish a culture of high expectations for person, for all personnel. And the second one would say establish a culture of high academic expectations for all students. I think I got all right. it. The motion has been uh, amended. We second. Have, and it's a second. So we have now have an amended motion on the floor concerning our approval of the superintendent's um, search leadership profile report based on the amendments that were put and changes that were presented by uh, Ms. James, provided by the board. Um, is there, are there any questions? All right, at this time, I'll ask for an approval. Amendment, you have to vote on the amendment. Sir. You just have to vote on the amendment because it supersedes the original one. I don't think so, but you can ask. We just have to vote, we start with the amendment first. Yes, and, yes. and once the amendment is approved, then you will take a vote on the motion as amended. Okay, so we're gonna take a vote on the, the um, amended, amendment, sorry. All in favor, um, press yes, and if you're on the camera, just raise your hand. All of, okay. All right, that, that amendment passes unanimously. All right. Mr. Morris, you're asking that we um, still vote on the motion even after it was amended? So now you will vote on the motion as amended. Okay. All right. All right, so we have any more questions on the current motion? Mrs. James. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Helliger. I just wanna pick up on something that Dr. Flynn mentioned, and that is um, that there's high alignment between what we're considering tonight in this leadership profile and policy BJA local and the uh, exhibit that's associated with it. BJA local is a superintendent's qualifications and duties. 
And the board reviewed this over a period of time in alignment with their planning and decision making policy series the B, in the BQ series. And I just wanted to point out to the community and to uh, the staff and to others who might who might be looking into the superintendency of Fort Bend ISD that these policy does align highly aligns with the profile that we're considering tonight. All right, thank you, Mrs. James. Any other comments? All right, all in favor of this the original motion, please press yes and raise your hand on the screen. All right, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, um, Dr. Flynn and Dr. Wellman and Dr. Barry and Mrs. Flores for um, the work that you all have done to help us create our leadership profile report. I also want to thank you to all the, I think it was 2,700 participants of the survey, as well as all the people that um, provided feedback with the focus group. So we appreciate your time and your input in order to um, create this profile. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. All right, thank you, appreciate you all. All right, our next agenda item for this evening, do you, oh, Dr. Do you want me to ask about something? Oh, oh one, we have one more question, sorry. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, to clarify um, if the strengths and challenges page that we were provided uh, will be published or provided to um, applicants. Um, when the board uh, is ready, it, it could go on uh, your website, and uh, and that that might be something worth doing. Um, I'm I didn't turn my video off. Uh, it, the host has stopped me, so I'm not being discourteous to you. Um, but anyway, um, it, and I know that you you had a concern about uh, some of the language in there, and we would be fine with modifying that language so that it. Uh, addresses the issue that you brought up, Ms. Hammond. Okay, very good, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you again. All right, we're gonna move on. Thank you all for joining us today. Do you all have any other comments um, for us, Dr. Flynn? Um, no, we, we, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I might add, can you hear me now? Oh. Yes, Dr. Barry. Okay, well, I got cut off earlier and I'm, I'm I've been back for a little while. I just want to add that we're now, we, after you've done this approval, uh, we're going to be moving into the process of recruiting, screening, and uh, vetting, and finding viable candidates. Uh, we've had a number of applications already come into our uh, system, and uh, we'll be going through those, and then we're going to be discussing uh, our recruitment efforts, and uh, we'll keep you informed as to what we're doing, but that primarily just know that's what we're doing at this point when you may not hear from us as often. And as we always do, we would close a meeting by saying, trust the process, it works. All right, well, we're excited about the, um, the applicants that are about to apply to this position. I, I know our community is, is, is eager to, to meet that our, our next superintendent. So thank you all for the work that you're about to about to do in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next, I, uh, Dr. Dupree. Yes.
All right, Dr. Dupree has returned and so has Ms. James. Thank you for going to find him. <laughs> All right, so our next item on our agenda is item number 7A1, which is the Sugar Land 95 Long Range Plan Update. I'm really excited about this. Um, one of the uh, first things um, that I had a conversation with Dr. Dupree once we, uh, once I became president was to get us moving and having that conversation again with uh, around the Sugar Land 95 and how we um, move forward with truly memorializing um, um, those men. And so we've had some conversations um, with the county as well as with Sojus as one of our community leaders. Um, and so wanted to get an update um, today and so we can kind of fill in um, the board on kind of what we've been doing over the last couple months, really. Very good, thank you, Madam President. And I'd like to thank um, Madam President for her leadership in the last few months, but also the board for their leadership throughout this entire process of addressing this very important issue that's critical to our community. Um, so um, we'll get right to it. There's a lot of work that's gone into this. It's been a journey, a lot of collaboration, a lot of work by our staff. So I'm gonna turn the program over to Anthony. Are you gonna introduce Dr. Anthony Delicato, our Chief of Staff in Collaborative Communities, who's, who's overseeing a lot of this effort. Anthony. Yes, sir, thank you, Dr. Dupree. Well, good evening, board. We're pleased to provide you an update tonight on the Sugar Land 95. Ms. Chastity Alanu Alladay will be presenting a summary of the work completed to date, proposed phases of a memorialization project, and possible board considerations. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Chastity. Good evening, President Haliger, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Dupree. It is my honor and privilege to stand before you and the Fort Bend community to advocate on behalf of the district in honor of the Sugar Land 95. Tonight's presentation will focus on providing the board with the goals and the recent actions of the Sugar Land 95 plan as an, in an overview of the proposed Sugar Land 95 memorialization project for board consideration. Before I get into the details of the Sugar Land 95 plan and the memorialization project, I'd like to provide some important background information about the discovery and updates for the Board of Trustees and our guest viewing tonight. On February 19th, 2018, a contractor working at the construction site of Fort Bend ISD's James Reese and Career Technical Center uncovered the first human remains. Under the guidance of the Texas Historical Commission, an archeological firm led the exhumation. They also studied the remains for further analysis and historical research to gain an understanding of what was found. What was unearthed during that study was shocking, an unmarked cemetery abandoned and lost to history. In total, 95 bodies were exhumed from the forgotten cemetery, 94 men, and presumably one woman of African-American descent. Through archival research, exhumation, and extensive laboratory studies, it was determined that the cemetery was associated with the state-sanctioned system of convict leasing that took place from 1871 to 1911 in Texas, all of the remains belonging to victims of that inhumane system. The history of convict leasing is not widely known or taught about in our nation's history. Following the Civil War, the system of convict leasing was made legal by a clause within the 13th Amendment. The clause allowed for the incarceration of many men and women, particularly those of color, as punishment of a crime. It was the need for a low-cost labor force after the war that many states, including the state of Texas, relied heavily on convict labor following the emancipation of slavery. This system was met with discriminatory practices that allowed for the re-enslavement of blacks under the pretenses of being criminals. In many cases, arrests were based on mere accusations 
and individuals were met with hefty penalties for petty crimes. The cemetery, now historically designated by the Texas Historical Commission as the Bullhead Convict Labor Force Cemetery, is located on what was once the Satarsha Plantation, owned by Mr. Littleberry Ellis. Mr. Ellis and his partner, Mr. Cunningham, became joint owners of the Texas prison system in 1878, when convict leasing had reached its peak in Texas. Mr. Ellis and Mr. Cunningham together would establish what would become the Imperial Sugar Mill, built on the low-cost labor performed by these black convicts. Blacks made up approximately 60% of the prison population during this period of convict leasing, although they only made up 30% of the state's population. The research proves that these individuals buried at the cemetery were subjected to the harshest of working and living conditions, with more than 70% of them passing away within the first two years of their sentence at the camp. The discovery of the cemetery has allowed for this hidden and dark period of our history to be brought to light. Today, Fort Bend ISD has the ability to share this information in order to promote the restoration of dignity for those who labored in life and who were forgotten in death as convict laborers. Since the discovery of the Sugarland 95 in 2018, Fort Bend ISD has been given the opportunity to lead by example. The discovery of the unmarked and forgotten cemetery has allowed the district to pursue a future that is beyond what we could have imagined. It is our commitment to serve as a model for our local community, state, and nation of how to properly acknowledge the past as a means to promote justice in the future. In 2019, the Board of Trustees was provided with this overview of actions and milestones reached from the initial land purchase in 2011 to the implementation of Fort B FB1, the local history standard that integrates the history of convict leasing and the Sugar Land 95 into our local social studies curriculum. Since that update, the district has worked diligently to develop a comprehensive plan to outline the next steps of appropriate actions that we will work towards as a way to uphold our commitment to the Sugar Land 95. The Sugar Land 95 memorial memorialization plan is rooted in three main goals education, community engagement, and memorialization preservation. Our goal of education is to advance opportunities for students, staff, and the broader community to learn about the system of convict leasing and the discovery of the Sugarland 95 through the creation of culturally relevant curriculum, instructional resources, and educational programming. Our goal of community engagement is to engage the community to increase their awareness, and understanding of the discovery as its, and its historic impact, as well as to provide opportunities that allow for the community to be involved in formal acts of acknowledgement and remembrance. Our final goal of memorialization preservation is to establish a memorial site that supports the historic preservation of this cemetery and the surrounding lands to serve as cultural resources in our community. The Sugar Land 95 plan focuses on encouraging our students, staff, and community to be lifelong learners and critical thinkers who are willing to learn about the tough history of convict leasing in our nation's past. Through educational advocacy and community engagement, we strive to foster compassionate citizenship by modeling care for others, inclusivity, and cultural awareness. We recognize the significance of the cemetery as a site which is worthy of preserving and we actively see, as we actively seek to promote diversity in our Fort Bend community. It is through the execution of the Sugarland 95 plan that we hope to inspire other communities who are faced with their own hidden histories or undesirable past to recognize the opportunity that they too have to educate and promote healing in their communities. I chose to insert this quote because I received it last week from a teacher at Fort Settlement Middle School as they integrated the Sugarland 95 lesson into their Texas history curriculum. 
She reached out to me, and we had about a 30-minute email conversation because her kids wanted to volunteer to work at the site. They were interested in learning more, and they were so proud to be learning about this local part of history in their social studies class. At this time, I'd like to provide the Board of Trustees and our community with an update of some of the recent accomplishments and actions taken by Fort Bend ISD as outlined in the Sugarland 95 plan. First, in February 2020, Fort Bend ISD launched its community education campaign, delivering the presentation, Found and Not Forgotten, the Sugarland 95, facilitated by yours truly. This presentation has been delivered at the local, state, and national levels. It is due to the success of this presentation that in the spring of 2020, the Texas Board of State Board of Education adopted a standard to address convict leasing, including the Sugarland 95, into the state's African American Studies course, which Fort Bend ISD is proud to offer for next school year. In August of 2020, the district released Back to Bondage, the final report of findings on the Sugarland 95 discovery, and began the process of reconfiguring the district's Sugarland 95 webpage. Community members can access the full report and the executive summary via the Sugarland 95 webpage. Our newest board members will also be receiving a copy of that following the presentation tonight. In September of 2020, Fort Bend ISD installed grave markers onto the burials and secured a perimeter fence to give a geographically accurate account of the shape and size of the cemetery. Currently, the cemetery is open for public visitation daily. At the beginning of 2021, just ahead of Black History Month, the district chose to re-engage the community by distributing the Sugarland 95 community mailer to over 140,000 homes in the Fort Bend ISD area. Most importantly, this February, the Texas Historical Commission approved the application for historic cemetery designation. This designation allows for the district to apply for a historical marker which the application is due in May. During this past year, the district has extended multiple invitations and calls to action for our community to engage leaders and organizations who are willing to support us in our memorialization effort. It is at this time I would like to introduce the board to the organizations who have expressed support and a commitment to assist us in achieving our goals aligned to the Sugarland 95 plan. The district has welcomed and invited the input of our state and local historical commissions. The Texas Historical Commission has been an invaluable resource in the designation of the cemetery as an important cultural site worthy of preservation. They've been more than supportive and encouraging as we strive to educate and memorialize on a grander scale. Additionally, Fort Bend County and the Fort Bend County Historical Commission has been great in collaborating with Fort Bend ISD throughout the planning process of the Sugarland 95 plan. They've assisted by providing us with historical images and resources for multiple projects and have engaged in discussions related to the overall scope of the plan. We appreciate their unwavering support. Next is the Society of Justice and Equality for the People of Sugarland, also known as SOGES. I was first introduced to members of SOGES last summer at a community event they held at the Reese Center. The goal of that event was to bring community awareness to the site and to advocate for broader memorialization of the Sugarland 95. SOGES is a nonprofit 501c3 whose primary objective is to memorialize the Sugarland 95. So Jess is comprised of community members who have lived in the Sugarland area for many years and have raised their children in Fort Bend ISD schools. Many of the members of So Jess, uh, sorry, many members of So Jess consist of local community members with a proven expertise in community advocacy, local government, capital project management, education, and law. So Jess is committed to community engagement 
and working with other nonprofits and organizations to increase the collaboration and to lead in fundraising efforts to memorialize the Sugarland 95. Many of them are here today. It is through the relationship and the support of SOGES that Fort Bend ISD was introduced to the organization Mass Design Group in October of 2020. Founded in 2008, Mass Design has an extensive experience in the United States and around the world. Mass Design's mission is to research, build, and advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. While introducing Mass Design for the 2017 National Design Award for Architecture, Chelsea Clinton stated that since Mass began in 2008, what has been central to their ethos and approach is that architecture must, must be both beautiful and centered on the dignity of the people whom it serves. One of Mass Design's most noted and acclaimed projects includes the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, often referred to as the single greatest work of 21st century American architecture. Other current projects of Mass includes the UK Holocaust Memorial Design and the MLK Memorial in Boston named The Embrace. All of their work centers on design that promotes healing, peace, and social justice. Fort Bend ISD feels that Mass Design is a perfect fit as a potential partner for this important project based on their experience in designing for dignity and their commitment to actively engaging our community in the project from start to finish. As a 501c3 nonprofit organization, Mass will prioritize our project's mission and is able to leverage philanthropic income to support partners in unlocking capital to invest in the built environment. The district would like to express thanks to these groups who have offered their support, their time, and their resources in this journey. The major component of the Sugarland 95 plan is the Sugarland 95 Memorialization Project. This is a long range plot project intended to create a comprehensive, aligned, and commemorative environment for the Sugarland 95. By executing the Sugarland 95 Memorialization Project, Fort Bend ISD, alongside our partners, will be able to properly memorialize the lives of those lost in the convict leasing system, and also to preserve the site as an important historic and cultural resource in our local, state, and national community. The Sugarland 95 plan, as projected, is proposed to consist of four phases, each aligned by a common vision and collaboration amongst partnering groups. Phase one is a small-scale exhibit inside of the James Reese Center. Phase two, the Sugarland 95 Outdoor Learning Plaza at the site of the Bullhead Convict Labor Force Camp Cemetery on the James Reese campus. An anticipated phase of a memorial park to serve as designated space to promote reflection and remembrance, and an additional anticipated phase with a museum and education center to highlight the history of convict leasing and the Sugarland 95 discovery. It should be clearly expressed that there is flexibility between the execution of the anticipated phases, as both of these projects would be carried out based on the terms within partnership agreements and funding. The plan as presented to you tonight is a collaborative effort between Fort Bend ISD, Mass Design Group, SOGES, and Fort Bend County, with each group taking the lead on their respective phases. It is our hope that the Sugarland 95 Memorialization Project symbolizes our commitment to honor, memorialize, and restore dignity to those who suffered under the state-sanctioned system of convict leasing. A few more details about each plan, each phase of the plan. Phase one of the project is inside of the Reese Center. The exhibit is currently under construction and expected to launch in December 2021. The exhibit will consist of two displays, both to include cases to house artifacts related to the discovery. The main display will highlight the history of convict leasing as it existed in Fort Bend County 
and the secondary display will focus primarily on the discovery, scientific research, and forensic analysis conducted in order to give us an accurate account of what occurred at the site and to tell us who are the Sugarland 95. The exhibit will provide an enrichment opportunity for our students participating in tours at the Reese Center and community members alike. Visitors will walk away with a deep understanding of the discovery and the importance that the site plays in our Fort Bend history. We look forward to inviting our students, staff, and community members into this important educational space. The next priority is the revitalization of the cemetery. As you can see from the image, there's a lot more that we can do to create a dignified site and a proper memorial ground for those laid to rest. As proposed, phase two of the project will be led by Fort Bend ISD in partnership with Mass Design. This phase of the project will involve the revitalization of this Texas Historic Cemetery to be a point of pride and honor in our community. The site will be the home to a monument, the official Texas Historical Commission historical marker, as well as other features, including informational signage. The site will contain a covered area suitable to facilitate engaging student learning opportunities year round, as well as community events, all aimed to educate and increase understanding about this part of history. We recognize the value of community engagement and community input is essential to the visioning of this phase. Therefore, Fort Bend ISD will be working closely with Mass Design and SOGES to engage the broader Fort Bend community in this important part of the project. The next phase is anticipated to be a memorial park developed by Fort Bend County. The district and Fort Bend County both believe that there is a collective responsibility as a community to honor those subjected to the convict leasing system. This outdoor space will be centered on memorializing the Sugarland 95 discovery and acknowledging the impact that, sugar, that convict labor had on the development of Fort Bend County and the state of Texas. This phase is contingent upon the district conveying land to the county for the sole purpose of creating a memorial park for the community. The county will work collaboratively with Fort Bend ISD and our community partners on the visioning and the design of the Memorial Park. The final anticipated phase is dedicated to the, to the establishment of a museum and education center. This phase is projected to be a collaborative project between SOGES, Mass Design, and Fort Bend ISD. SOGES's goal is to create the Sugarland 95 experience, which will bring healing to the community based on the atrocities caused by convict leasing and other examples of systemic racial injustice. Students and visitors will be able to explore the history as well as science behind the discovery of the Sugarland 95, such as the forensics, biology, genetics, and even the chemistry associated with sugar production. The Education Center will promote community programming and support the district in their education efforts. The development of this phase is also contingent upon the conveyance of land and an official partnership agreement between SOGES and Fort Bend ISD. Since the discovery, there has been much discussion about what can and what should be done to memorialize this historic discovery. In light of the events of 2020 and early 2021, it is a common understanding that now is the time to work towards peace, justice, and healing in our society. Fort Bend ISD embraces this opportunity to be good stewards of this sacred land. As we now know the underlying history and can recognize the long lasting impact that the injustices have played in our community. The next few slides provide some details about the reasons why the district desires to execute this plan. Over the past decade, there's been heightened attention and an expressed need for social justice. In the wake of recent events, there has been an increased support in projects related to racial justice, civil rights, 
and the preservation of African American history and culture. With that being stated, now is the time to amplify our efforts to shed light on this discovery, as it plays a great role in the movement to tell the full history of America and to tell the contributions that African Americans have played in our society. With the help and support of Fort Bend County, we now have a clear vision and a path forward in developing the historic lands into a memorial park. As you can see on the slide, the county is fully prepared to execute their, their phase of the project due to having secured funding. As of April 2021, the Mass Design Group has submitted a proposal to Fort Bend ISD, which includes the donation of services for the initial design plan of the project. By launching this project with our partners, their nonprofit status will allow Fort Bend ISD the ability to tap into financial resources that we would otherwise not have access to and to engage in philanthropic outreach to help finance these projects. This is a very realistic goal. As last year, the National Park Service granted over $14 million to preserve sites of African-American significance. And to date, the National Trust for Historic Preservation has granted over $7 million to support nonprofit organizations who seek to advance the preservation of sites, museums, and landscapes representing African-American cultural heritage. Research indicates that over the past 10 years, over $17.1 billion has been granted, pledged, and invested in projects that support racial justice and equity. Considering the magnitude of this discovery, we are confident that this project will garner the support and the attention needed to be successful. The plan as presented has taken several months of visioning, collaboration, and discussions. A major inspiration for the Sugarland 95 Memorialization Plan stems from similar projects in vision, mission, scale, and scope. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice and Legacy Museum, as well as the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Park, both serve to confront the history of racial injustice towards African Americans in the past as a means to repair the painful legacy observed in the present. In an article I read, Father Richard Rohr stated about restoring justice, that you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. In Fort Bend, we believe that you cannot acknowledge what you don't understand. I believe that we have an obligation to share this history as a way to increase understanding about the inhumane system of convict leasing and its impact. The district acknowledges that we possess this unique opportunity to do something impactful for the greater good of humanity through this project. As stated by one of my good friends, a magnificent discovery requires a magnificent action. I would be remiss to not give proper praise and credit for this project vision to the late Mr. Reginald Moore. Despite disagreements in the past, Fort Bend ISD has a great deal of respect for Mr. Moore, his advocacy, his work, and his contributions to our community. Since his passing, I've been able to reestablish communication and to collaborate with his lovely wife, Ms. Marilyn Moore. We believe that in order to properly educate the students and the community, we must include the legacy of Mr. Moore as he exemplified the characteristics of servant leadership and compassionate citizenship. The image to the right is an agenda with Mr. Moore's handwritten notes dating back to 2013. Almost a decade ago, long before the discovery, Mr. Moore had the idea of establishing a park, a memorial cemetery, and a museum dedicated to the history of convict leasing. Based on the information that was presented, the district is requesting that our Board of Trustees consider the following. Consider the staff proposal to conduct an archeological survey of the entire Fort Bend ISD owned property adjacent to and surrounding the Bullhead Camp Cemetery. Consider the staff proposal to engage Mass Design Group on the creation of an outdoor learning area 
and a historic monument at the Bullhead Camp Cemetery site. Continue negotiations with Fort Bend County regarding the possible conveyance of land for the development of a memorial park and the con to consider the request made by SOGES for the conveyance of land for the development of a museum and education center. At this time, I would like to provide the Board of Trustees with a chance to ask any clarifying questions. Thank you um, so much for that presentation. Every time you provide a presentation on Sugar Land 95, I always learn so much and it's very informative. And um, I, I just appreciate the thoughtfulness um, and the thoroughness that you have put together in this pre presentation. And the ideal here was to, <clears throat> there were some questions before around land and you know what we should do. And so the ideal was let's take an entire look at the full property and understand um, what what we really can do with the property instead of trying to piecemeal properties. And let's, let's put a strategic plan together for the property. I mean, the property is sacred land, and we want to make sure that we, um, we operate in such that preserves that um, sacredness around the land. So uh, that's kind of where we've been. We've had a couple of meetings, and we want to make sure that you all were aware of what's been happening and give you all the opportunity to ask questions. Um, is this the right direction? Um, you know, just, just to have a discussion around it. And I see Mrs. James is, um, who did? Someone else had her hand up? Okay. All right, Ms. James. Well, thank you, Ms. Helliger, and thank you um, for your work in, in bringing this all together. And Chastity, thank you for coming tonight. I've heard you present a couple of times, and just like Ms. Helliger says, I learn something new every time, and I appreciate how you've taken this as a mission to be in the public arena, to be traveling, and to share the story. And thank you very much for doing that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really important. Thank you. Uh, the first time that I um, had heard about uh, Mr. Moore and his passion for um, this discovery was uh, we were having a listening session at one of our middle schools and I was sitting at a table with Mr. Rosenthal and Mr. Moore came to that meeting and he sat down at the table and he started to sh share that he thought that there, there was gonna be a discovery when we started building the Reese Center. And uh, this is the first time that I'd heard this. I think this is the first time Mr. Rosenthal had heard it too. Um, but we immediately took that information and we said to Dr. Dupree, do you know anything about this? What can we do? What should we do? And so that started a conversation that led to archeologists being on site and um, as you have explained, uh, the journey that we've been to has been, has been a long one. And I want to acknowledge one person that I don't, I'm sure you've acknowledged them, but I will say, say it um, again. There was a backhoe driver mm -hmm. that stopped his work and because he thought he saw something. And this is after the archeologists had left the site. This is. He wasn't being supervised by any person to, to do this, but I don't know who that person was, but he stopped his, his backhoe so that, uh, because he thought he saw something when he was backfilling a ditch. And that act right there is something that's led us on this journey, which is so remarkable. And I just wanna say that because I, I, I find that to be the linchpin, and this is a really critical point in, in this conversation. So thank you for your efforts in helping all of us to learn about convict leasing and convict labor, labor as slavery by another name. And these um, petty crimes or crimes that were just based on race and based on uh, segregation practices that People were convicted and then they were brought into the prison system just to perform labor for, and uh, to provide cheap labor for, for landowners, plantation owners. And 
I am sure I have let more to learn about where this convict, where convict leasing was used, but uh, I'll look forward to that journey. Um, and I want to reiterate something else. I didn't capture it all. I tried to when you were saying it, but I too believe that it is a blessing that Fort Bend ISD and its diversity are the ones that made this discovery. And I am very grateful for that, um, for that for our community. And I want to also say that I feel we have an obligation to share about it. And as you've done so eloquently multiple times, we have an obligation to educate our students as you've also um, uh, convinced the State Board of Education to include the mm -hmm. standard. And we've got the African American Studies course coming and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that as that develops and students experience that. Um, but we also all have an obligation to continue to learn about the Sugarland 95, the convict leasing program, and all of the um, the black history and the and the uh, heritage that is so rich in our community. So, I don't have a question, Madam President, but I just wanted to say that because I've been on this journey for a really long time now, and uh, I'm very proud of Fort Bend ISD, and I'm particularly proud of you, Chastity, for thank for you, Miss James. A spokesperson. All right, Dr. Shirley. First of all, Chastity, I just want you to know um, your voice and your passion, your passion comes through your voice and it's very easy to listen to you. And as you, you stand there and then I know Sojess is over here, and the ladies and the gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Thank you for putting something out there that possibly no one saw. And, you know, I, I struggle to share this, but, um, you know, going back all the way to the 70s, I can remember where the Sugarland Mill was, and Highway 90 stopped right there, and then there were the cane fields. And I remember traveling through the cane fields because my daddy was right there at Jester Unit when we came from California. And he often talked about slave labor. And, uh, you know, in hearing this, and this is the first time that I actually learned about what was going on. You've heard it and you hear stories, but to actually have this, and thank you for my back to bondage. <laughs> I can't wait to show it to my husband as well as my mom. So, um, and Grail, thank you, Miss James, thank you so much for your passion in, in, in your voice and what I hear. And this is something that we really did need to document so that when, when we move forward, we understand it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just want it just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Gillen. Very good. Um, Ms. Williams? Yes, um, I have something to say about the, uh, the creation of a museum. We are talking about uh, Cumbie Gleason as if it does not currently exist. We are currently using uh, prison labor down in the uh, county jail in Richmond, Texas. We are currently using uh, convict labor, labor in our federal prison system. So convict leasing is not a thing of the past. Yes, I support um, the presentation that the young lady gave with all due respect to her. I'm not trying to minimize what she's there saying, but I need those to hear me. If Fort Bend County was serious about um, their passion for convict leasing, I think we should stop doing it down in Fort Bend County. We should lead the nation in that area. We shouldn't just go where the grants are of high dollar value and we want to, you know, have the same group of uh, community volunteers jump to this project now. 
We need to expand it to include more community members, but we can't be hypocritical. Convict leasing is alive and well. Convict leasing has not died. So uh, we talk about the fight for justice and, and we want to lead for that. I just believe that if Fort Bend County is serious, let's be the example and not the complete and utter hypocrite. And again, to the people in the audience, I did enjoy that uh, presentation, but it was just a little hard to take in uh, as an activist, knowing that this uh, process still occurred uh, right now in our country. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Ms. Williams. All right, so Ms. Ms. Hannah. Thank you, Ms. Helliger. Uh, Chastity, thank you for the presentation. Um, and thank you for the, the SOGIS group um, members that are here tonight. I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see what's before us now in memorializing um, the, the 95 um, that were um, buried here by our James Reese Center. But what I also want to say is I, I really want to recognize Reginald Moore and the group of people that are here and Chastity as well, because not only I heard you talk about Mr. Moore as a compassionate citizen as, and a servant leader, but I think we have that also here in our audience with, with the, the members of SOGIS. But even, even more than that, I think we have, um, we have a we have a springboard for not just teaching about the, the convict leasing um, as a historical piece. I think we have it as a, a, a opportunity to teach about leadership and how one voice um, and, and then a small group um, can, can help make change and, and help further, further educate us um, to, be, to be better citizens and to be better uh, aware of how we engage in our community. And so I, I really appreciate this and I, I, I do look forward to seeing the, um, uh, the documents for consideration. I'm assuming that we'll get some formal um, proposals and, and that type of thing. Can, can, when can we expect that, Dr. DeFree? Probably starting in May and June. In May and June, okay. Ma Thank you very much. And I referred to the Sugar Lane 95 Memorial Plan several times. Um, I used to be a teacher, so I know if you give people things ahead of the presentation, they'll look at them and not look at you. So I've provided you with the actual comprehensive plan, or pretty much word for word, what was spoken tonight will be in here for you to go back and consult. It lines up with the slides pretty perfectly. All right, thank you so much. I mean, this is, again, just wanted to reiterate all the sentiments that were shared by um, the board members, and I know all, all of our board members share the same around the work that has been done thus far. And I wanted to also highlight um, not only soldiers for, for being here tonight and for the work that they continue to do, but I also wanted to highlight the Texas Historical Commission, um, the Texas um, Cemetery, and the Fort Bend, and Fort Bend County as well, because they've been on this journey through this whole process. And so I wanted to recognize um, them for um, the work that they've done to get us here. Without those conversations and the back and the forth, we would not be here today to look at this full entire strategic plan for that land. And so I'm excited about moving forward. And it sounds like, um, based on the comments, that um, we we kind of have a green light to kind of move forward and provide and bring back uh, bring back to the board more specifics uh, around the planning. Thank you, Ms. Helliger. And if I could just acknowledge Ms. Moore. I know she probably didn't want me, Ms. Ms. Oh, Marilyn Moore. All right. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Who knew? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cassidy. All right. Where is my agenda? I think we're going to closed session now. <clears throat> okay.
Okay. All right. Now we will um, convene in closed session under Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551 under the following sections, 551071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law, Section 551072, consider purchases, exchange, leases, or value of real property, Sections 551074, personnel matters, Section 551076, security matters, Section 551082, student discipline matters or complaint, or Section 551-0821, personally identifiable information about public school students. We are now in closed session.
Um, I think we have a quorum. It is now 1028 and we are now in open session. Our next item on the agenda is 8A, personnel actions. Consider approval of superintendent's resignation agreement. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the superintendent's resignation agreement as presented. Second. Are there any questions? Has Ms. Williams come back, come back yet? It's been properly moved and seconded. <clears throat> Any questions? So please go ahead and vote. If you're on the screen, raise your hand. The voting box. Oh, the, yeah. The bo please use your voting box. Yeah. For those of us in the room. All right. That passes unanimously with six votes. All right. The next is to consider appointment of acting superintendent. Yes, Madam President, I move the board appoint Deanna Saavedra as acting superintendent and approve the stipend contract as presented. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any questions? All right, at this time I ask for you to go. Oh, yes. Ms. Hannah. Yes, so I, d I don't really have a question, but I do have a comment. And it's, um, it's about just around these first two items on the consent agenda, and I, I just want to um, say that we're, we're facing- but This is not a consent agenda. This is not? This is not. No. Okay, so I, it needs to be a question. No, right now the, the question is on consider the appointment of an acting superintendent. Do you have a question on that particular item? Uh, no. All right, the consent agenda is under number 12. Okay. All right, so, any, so no, no questions? All right, go ahead and vote, please. Use your box <clears throat> on your hand if you're on the screen. All right, that, that motion passes with um, unanimously with seven votes. The next item is number 8A3, deliberate executive director. Well, I got you, Madam President. So I think there's the remaining items are um, appointments to new positions, that's items 8A3 through 8A12. Seven, actually. Is it seven? Yep. Okay. And then Shirley's got eight and nine. Okay, 8A3 through 8A7. Can I get a motion, please? Yes, Madam President. I move that the Board of Trustees appoint the following people to the following positions. Wendy Nunez to the position of Executive Director of Elementary Schools, Jennifer Chadwick to the position of Director of Social Emotional Learning and Enrichment Programs, Yvette Mendoza to the position of Ridgemont Early Literacy Center Instructional Officer, Dr. Reginald Brown as the Principal of Dulles Middle School, Dr. Jennifer Williams as the Principal of Fort Settlement Middle School, Brandy Brooks as the Principal of Hodges Bend Middle School, Dr. Cosette Church Gaston as the principal of Krista McAuliffe Middle School, Sonia Evans as the principal of Blue Ridge Elementary School, and Justin, Justin Korak as the principal of Lantern Lane Elementary School. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Do we have any questions on those appointments? If none, please go ahead and vote. That item passes with seven, with seven, unanimously with seven votes. Congratulations to all those who were appointed um, this evening to your respective positions. All right, um, item 8A8. Yes, Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees terminate the probationary employment contract of Patricia Frazier at the end of the contract period in the best interest of the district and the direct and direct the superintendent to provide notice of the board's action as required by law. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do we have any questions? Hearing none, please go ahead and vote. Mm. 
That motion passes unanimously with seven votes. Madam President, it's recommended that you take up items nine and 10 together. There's a motion that will address both those items. Okay. Who has that motion? Is that? Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation to propose the non-renewal of the term contract of Barbara Perkins at the end of the 2020-2021 contract year and to authorize the superintendent to provide notice of the board's actions. And number two, that the Board of Trustees conduct the hearing of the proposed non-renewal. I believe, is that correct? Uh, I need to repeat that. That is correct. Okay. I move the Board of Trustees, number one, accept the superintendent's recommendation to propose the non-renewal of the term contract of Barbara Perkins at the end of the 2020 2021 contract year and authorize the superintendent to provide notice of the board's action and number two, that the board of trustees conduct the hearing of the proposed non-renewal. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do we have any questions? All right, please vote. That motion passes unanimously with seven votes. All right, item 8A11. Uh, yes, um, I move that the Board of Trustees renew and award probationary term and non-Chapter 21 contracts to specified certified employees for the 2021-2022 contract year as presented under separate cover. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do I have any questions? All right. If you all could please vote. That motion passes unanimously with seven votes. The next item is 8A12. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees assign the level three employee grievance appeal of Ritu Singh to Myra Shexnader who will serve as the board's designated hearing officer under board policy DGBA local. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Do we have any questions? All right, please vote. All right, that motion passes unanimously with seven votes. All right. Moving on to item 11, board members report, activity report. Mrs. James. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Since our last meeting, the board's participated in the following. Special called meeting for the superintendent search firm planning, the board president's superintendent search video recording session, a student achievement discussion, student leadership 101 session seven, a lifelong learner, the Touchdown Club of Houston Sportsmanship Luncheon, National School Board Association Virtual Conference, a special called meeting for the board's self-evaluation, one-on-one -on -one trustee meetings with the superintendent search firm, the 2020 Teacher of the Year event, and the 2021 Teacher of the Year event, the board workshop meeting, the Kempner High School Exemplary Partnership ribbon cutting ceremony, the SHAC meeting, a special called meeting for the Vision and Planning Committee, Hilton of the Americas Kickstart Gala, a policy committee meeting, Dr. Gilliam's campus visits, the GT Task Force Acceleration Subcommittee meetings, the GT Task Force meeting, the Fort Bend ISD Virtual GT Parent Symposium, Baylor University Center for Gifted Education and Talent Development Virtual Parent Conference, Fort Bend ISD and the Fort Bend Association of Parents for Academic Excellence Virtual Summer Camp Expo, the Gifted Education Family Network Executive Board Meeting, the Willow Ridge High School Houston Food Bank School Market Food Distribution Event, the Gulf Coast Area Association of School Boards Virtual Spring Workshop, Varsity Softball Games, All-In Mentoring at Blue Ridge Elementary School, 
the Pandemic Stakeholder Advisory Committee meetings and the SHAC Legislative Committee meeting. Thank you, Mrs. James. Okay, our next report is our annual board training report. There are three tiers for this report. Tier one is a local um, district orientation and the Texas Education Quarter orientation or update. Tier two is a team building and assessment. Tier three is continuing education and assess, and assess needs. Each tier is further broken down by delineated first term board members and experienced board members. Um, Fort Benign has, has three term board members. Tier one requires a local district orientation and three hours of Texas Education Court orientation. All Fort Bend ISD trustees have met tier one requirements. Tier two requires a minimum of three hours of team building and assembly annually. All Fort Bend ISD trustees have met this requirement. Tier three requires a minimum of 10 hours of continued education and assess needs. All Fort Bend ISD trustees have met this requirement as required by the Texas State Board of Education. Each trustee and the superintendent have been provided with a copy of the Framework for School Board Development and Board Policy, BBD. Okay. All right. All right. Our next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. All right. So, can I get a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the entire consent agenda as presented. Second. The proper move in a second. Do we have any questions? No? Okay. All right. There are no questions at this time. I take a vote. This motion passes unanimously with seven votes. All right. Our next item on our agenda is item D, no, no, I'm sorry, number 13, which is, we don't have any other further actions. We have review the future board meeting agenda items number 14. Yes, ma'am, we'll be back next week on May 3rd. We're gonna have a few information items, including the School Health Advisory Council update facilities master plan update, and then the 2021-22 planning and budgeting update. On the following week on the 10th, the board will conduct the, the um, bu public budget meeting and consider adoption of the budget. Um, we're also hopeful to have an update on the Microsoft Showcase School progress and during the next, during the May board meetings. Um, on May 12th, the board, there'll be a special call meeting, that's a Wednesday night of two weeks out to um, recognize retiring trustees, trustee Grail James, canvas results of the May 1st election, which is this Saturday, and then swear in an elected trustees from that election and elect board officers. In June, you'll hit the board will hear updates from staff on special populations, 
including bilingual ESL, gifted and talented in special education, student discipline, including disproportionality, and consider other business matters related to wrapping up the, fin the fiscal year. Those are the major reports that are on the um, horizon. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dupree. And I think Ms. Um, James, we're gonna get an update as well. Yes, Madam President, I just wanna let you know that uh, the subcommittee of the Vision and Planning Committee um, from our meeting the other day has been working on a draft board self-evaluation. So we'd like to bring that to the board for input um, next Monday, if that's um, possible. Very good, I look forward to, for, forward to um, hearing our update. I think it's much needed. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right, we are now adjourned. Thank you, everyone.